seems like we have a quorum, uh, 601. We will try not to take too much of everybody's very valuable time then. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program entitled Controversial Topics in the Pelvis, Pelvic Mesh. This is our disclosure slide and participants will be given a link at the end of this evening's program to claim CME credit. So allow us to introduce ourselves. We are your moderators, both FPMRS board certified members of the Pelvic Health Center here at Stanford. I'm Lisa Rogogupta. I'm uh, a pro associate professor of urogynecology here at Stanford uh, and would love to promote multidisciplinary education, research, and clinical care throughout the path of my career. I trained at Columbia uh, in OBGYN and then did a female urology fellowship at UCLA. And my role here is as medical director of gynecology and gynecologic specialties at Stanford. Hi, uh, my name is Kavita Mishra. I'm an assistant professor of urogynecology and uh, the director of urogynecology at the Pelvic Health Center. Um, I uh, trained primarily at Brown University and did my residency and fellowship there and was practicing at UCSF for two years before coming to Stanford recently. Um, and most of my interest has been in multidisciplinary approaches uh, for patients with complex pelvic floor disorders, as well as some medical student education. Um, today, uh, we'll go through our program outline. So we're going to give you a brief background um, and then go into our speaker presentations, um, as well as finally our expert panel. Um, I'm going to, um, before we go into more detail about the topic, I wanted to review the logistics of the session a little bit. Um, first off, as you probably saw when you logged in, this session will be recorded and the link will be provided to you once the video is available. Um, second, we'll focus on the bottom of your screen um, where you'll see three buttons, the chat, raise hand, and Q&A button. Um, to submit a question, you'll click on the Q&A button and type your question there. Um, remember that your um, a screen name um, uh, may or may not be hidden uh, while uh, you're attending the conference, but if you wish to ask your question anonymously, you can click um, a button that says uh, question anonymous and that will give you the option to do that. The other function in the Q&A is a thumbs up button that allows you to uh, like a specific question that has been asked and if you quick click on that it will move the question higher up and give priority to the question for the Q&A session later. Um, the other things um, to review, we'd like to minimize the use of, use of the raise hand function. We'll fo be focused more on the Q&A, and we'd also like you to minimize use of the chat if possible. Um, uh, now I'll go into a little bit of background about this topic. Um, so uh, Dr. Rogogupta and I, we are female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery specialists, um, which is training available to both gynecologists and uro urologists who specialize in pelvic floor, floor problems and complex management. Um, especially with our aging population, pelvic floor problems are widespread and very common. Urinary and bowel incontinence are the top reasons for nursing home placement, and 18% of women will undergo surgery for pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence in their lifetime. Um, this talk is really for anyone who takes care of women or has a mother or grandmother or sister um, who wants to understand what is pelvic mesh, why is it placed, and when is it a problem? How should we manage these issues? Um, mesh, especially polypropylene mesh, has had widespread use in surgery since 1958. And in the pelvis, we use it for urinary incontinence, vaginal prolapse, and rectal prolapse. Um, we can place mesh either abdominally or through vaginal incisions um, and complications such as mesh infection, exposure, erosion, these can be very challenging to manage. So why the controversy? I think the topic of mesh for pelvic floor disorders can trigger many different emotions. Many of us, and I'm making the assumption based on the fact that you're all logged in today, uh, are frustrated by the lack of high quality scientific data, 
regarding identification and treatment of these potential issues, the rapid turnover of commercially available products, and this impression that seems to be uh, out in the media that surgeons are performing dangerous surgery. We're clearly, us as public reconstructive surgeons, have always had the goal to improve quality of life for men and women. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why it triggers so many emotions. Uh, in light of these complexities, the American Urogynecologic Society, along with the International Urogynecologic Society, has recently put out uh, this past month some uh, guidance uh, document that I recommend everyone check out as a resource to help uh, providers who are seeing these patients help navigate the conversations. Um, the position statement does recommend that some patients may warrant evaluation or second opinion consultation in a center that can provide consultation across multiple disciplines and coordinate this multi multidisciplinary care if deemed appropriate. This may be routine in cancer care and transplant care, but it has not historically been a core part of pelvic reconstructive surgery in the US. So that kind of leads us to why us? Why are we talking about it tonight? Our mission at the Pelvic Health Center is just that. We provide a wide range of consultation or diagnostic or treatment options in one suite across these traditional departments of surgery, urology, gastroenterology, urogynecology, physical therapy. So we care for men and women who undergo mesh implantation or many who are asking for consultation regarding potential complications. Our group here is fellowship trained and in turn we jointly train fellows to try and encourage future generations uh, to cross those traditional lines. Uh, while we fully acknowledge that when it comes to surgery and its complications, there is definitely no one single way to practice. We do hope that our shared experience tonight will help continue this conversation um, and provide uh, another resource to surgeons out there um, and other providers who have or have not encountered patients with these conditions uh, and just give them a resource of, of where to go from there. So moving on, uh, we are now going into the individual speaker presentation section of the evening. We will introduce each speaker prior to their individual presentations. First, Dr. Eric Sokol will present FDA position on MESH, historical perspectives, and current recommendations. This will be followed by Dr. Anem Chukwu speaking about MESH use for stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And last but certainly not least will be Dr. Gerland speaking about MESH use on the rectum. Just a reminder, speakers, to go ahead and mute if you're not speaking and end the screen share when you are done. Um, so our first speaker today is um, Dr. Eric Sokol. Um, he's an associate professor for urogynecology um, and also an associate director of the fellowship um, for female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Um, as he uh, wrote in his intro, he bleeds blue. He graduated from University of Michigan in Wayne State and then left home for an OBGYN residency at Northwestern. He then did a fellowship at Brown before realizing that the West Coast is the best coast. Um, and I agree with him. Um, he has been at Stanford for 15 years, during which time his academic focus has been in biodesign and the development of novel therapies for pelvic floor disorders. He, hold multi he holds multiple patents and travels the world serving on multiple professional committees, giving scientific lectures and leading our specialty societies to make FPMRS the LPMRS world a more interesting place. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, one of the most engaging speakers I've had the pleasure of working with, Dr. Eric Sokol. Well, thanks for the introduction. Well, now you're just setting me up to fail. But I'm going to share my screen here. So uh, let me pull my slides up. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me um, go there, share screen, share. OK. Everybody hopefully can see my screen and let me get started. Great. Well, firstly, I want to thank Dr. Gerland for putting this all together. And it's always, it's 
we're like dying to see people. So it's great to even see the people that I work with who we haven't seen a lot of lately, but I'm talking about the uh, FDA position on mesh. And I'll give you a historical perspective, um, kind of what's, where mesh came from, why it's used, and then what's going on, and then what the current recommendations are, as, as the others have mentioned. Um, go to the next slide. These are my disclosures. I have some grant funding from NIH and some foundations. Uh, no grant funding directly to me, all to the university, and no disclosures as related to this talk. Learning objectives for this talk are firstly to compare the different types of vaginal mesh uh, kits and grafts that uh, have uh, in the past been available. Then to have a discussion and assess efficacy and complications of um, mesh. We'll examine the FDA actions regarding mesh uh, from a historical perspective and where we are now. And then lastly, we can discuss a little bit of, about the evolving landscape surrounding mesh, although I think that some of the other talks are gonna touch on that as well. Um, so um, not long ago, a friend of ours, Ingrid Nygaard, published um, an article in JAMA, which looked at how common, um, what the prevalence is for pelvic floor disorders based on various demographic uh, categories in non-pregnant women. And uh, nobody has to memorize this slide, but what was surprising was that about a quarter of all non-pregnant women in the United States over the age of 20 have more than one pelvic floor disorder at any given time. That's a really surprisingly high number. Um, and what's more, about 50% of women over the age of 80 have had more than one pelvic floor disorder in their lifetime. In their lifetime. So these things, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse are highly, highly, highly prevalent. Very, very common and therefore, prolapse surgery, for instance, as is urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence surgery, those are common too. An old paper, which uh, was uh, by Olson, showed a linear increase um, dependent on age in your risk of having surgery for pelvic organ prolapse, for women anyway. And, and um, that was in 1997. And as Kavika noted, that uh, rate of surgery for prolapse and urinary incontinence now is about 18% about 20% lifetime risk in some studies by the age of 80 of undergoing a procedure for one of these pelvic floor disorders. Um, but one of the reasons um, that MESH came about actually is because of failure risks. Some studies suggest an up to 40% risk of needing a re-intervention for failure. For instance, somebody who's had a prolapse repair, the prolapse comes back in their lifetime and they need a re-intervention. Often that's at the same site 60% of the time, but a third of the time it's at a different site. When, for instance, if you had the bladder lifted back up, you could have a prolapse of the top of the vagina like the uterus or the rectum. And there's a lot of possible reasons for this. Um, there are anatomic reasons, of course, but we think too, and Dr. Chen's done some research on this, that there are various tissue factors related to collagen content, collagen metabolism, and structure um, that may put certain people at risk for failure if they've undergone a procedure or even at risk, a higher risk to develop a problem such as prolapse in the first place. There are a lot of medical factors that have been linked to failure of surgical intervention for prolapse as well, including anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure such as obesity, constipation, asthma, COPD, you get the picture. There may be surgical factors as well, and those things can be impaired healing and scarring. It could be somebody who's on steroids. Maybe it's just really bad surgery. Maybe the wrong surgery is chosen or there's been poor surgical techniques. There are a variety of factors that can lead to an increased risk of failure after prolapse repair. So um, because of that high failure rate, which uh, as I showed earlier was, is, is kind of alarmingly high, um, a bunch of surgeons in France actually developed the first vaginal mesh kit. This was developed by nine surgeons, some of whom I, I know and are wonderful people in the year 2000. The concept or idea behind it was that um, people may have very weakened, attenuated tissue, very poor fascia, nothing to really kind of reconstruct or put back together, and therefore mesh might augment that. And synthetic mesh would, was probably and probably is stronger than that tissue, almost like rebar in construction. Their idea was to standardize surgery for advanced pelvic organ prolapse um, with these little kits, which you can see a picture of. And the initial um, surgeries had these trocars or kind of needle systems that went through the skin into the vagina and pulled the mesh uh, through the muscle um, in between, say, the, the vaginal wall and the bladder or the vaginal wall. 
Well, this caught on really quickly because it was a very compelling healthcare need. And uh, the original mesh grafts for prolapse were actually um, approved by FDA in, uh, cleared in the United States in March of 2004, but they did not go through the pre-market approval process. Instead, they went through the 510K process, which means that the device that can be marketed has to just be substantially equivalent or similar um, to a legally marketed device that is not subject to pre-market approval. I have 60 slides in this talk, but I've narrowed it down for the 10 minute talk. But if anybody's ever interested, it's uh, interesting that these products actually were not based on prolapse devices. In any case, you'd say, well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, this became a booming business. And as you can see here, by the height of the kind of mesh material market um, used for prolapse by uh, 2011, they were doing between 25 and $30 million of business a quarter selling vaginal mesh kit grafts. This led to the perfect storm. If anybody was, in, I don't know, in the audience, if there are people that are in the OBGYN space, but we used to have industry representatives come in and say, well, you got to start using this. Everybody's using it. Your surgeries are going to fail if you don't. It's really easy to use and just come to a weekend course. But there were no hospital credentialing systems in place at that time. And in fact, it was marketed to everybody. Anybody could use mesh, whether you ever did prolapse surgery or not. In fact, there was no, no subspecialty certification for FPMRS until, uh, formally until 2013. We were all in the first group of people board certified. And so the other problem was you had to know a heck of a lot about the things that could be lurking underneath the skin because these systems were placed through the skin and into the vagina while having to avoid the rectum or the bladder or nerves or blood vessels. So you could see it could be tricky. In any case, uh, I think it's really helpful to know um, that when we, when we talk about mesh, there are a lot of different kinds of mesh. And I've kind of thought of them now these as categories. The first generation of mesh kits for prolapse um, had external trocars that were placed from the outside of the body inside of the vagina. And then the mesh was pulled back through with straps through the muscles to hold them in place. Second generation kits were internal, internally fixated. They didn't have to go through the skin. You'd make an incision in the vagina implant the mesh where you were, say, for instance, under the bladder, into the cervix or over the rectum, and then fix it with little kind of tacks into ligaments or muscle. And then there were a few attempts at um, grafts without any fixation points that just stuck, were placed near, and then grew next to these ligaments. And, and, and this is one of the most popular that was ever invented. This is the ProLift, which was a kind of a, a system that had a lot of arms um, that were ankled, anchored through the muscle. But you can see it was a big mesh graft and these, the newer versions were a little bit smaller with only fixation internally. Anyway, so what's the evidence? Well, I'm gonna, I get to decide because uh, I'm the speaker on this one. So I'm gonna highlight three studies that we did, which actually the FDA did use to create their guidance. We were part of a randomized, a, a multi-center group that did the VAMP, VAMP study of vaginal mesh for prolapse. And we randomly assigned women to get mesh grafts for their prolapse or traditional uh, prolapse surgery with sutures with the primary objective to, to test whether mesh placement improved objective anatomic uh, outcomes compared to traditional surgery and a variety of secondary measures including improvements in quality of life and short and long-term complications and morbidity. But in sum, what we found in the first publication, uh, which was in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, was that while mesh may have some benefit, particularly underneath the bladder in the short term, there was a pretty high erosion rate pretty quickly, up to 15.6%. So this questioned the value of mesh, which had become so common, it was almost standard to use for a lot of uh, surgeons. We followed that same cohort out to a year in the American Journal, then we published our one-year uh, follow-up of the randomized trial and similarly found that while most patients did well, regardless of which arm, if they had surgery for their prolapse, they were happy whether they had or didn't have mesh, high satisfaction, mesh was associated with an overall high reoperation rate, higher than without the mesh because of these um, graft erosions and, and pain um, with a greater than 15% risk of exposure. Lastly, in the three-year VAMP study, we, we followed that same cohort out three years and again observed that there was symptomatic improvement in quality of life measures um, and no difference in outcomes in terms of individual prolapse points with cure rates that were very similar at three years. But again, um, there was a much higher uh, risk of complications in the mesh group. Importantly, only one new erosion after one year. So that was useful to know.
So large uh, meta-analyses have, have been done, and the Cochrane Review summarized 37 randomized controlled trials for mesh repair and found that while there was perhaps slightly better anatomic outcomes and a little lower recurrence with fewer, re fewer reoperations for recurrence, there was overall higher reoperations with an overall risk of mesh exposure for all the different meshes on the market of 8%, 8 and, more, and more risk of urinary incontinence when you unkink things with a mesh graft or a bladder injury than, than when you under, only performed a native tissue repair. Also, um, in a <coughs> randomized looking at randomized trials and meta-analysis of six trials, looking at whether uterine or vaginal vault prolapse improved with mesh, basically showed there was limited evidence to support the use of mesh with no differences in prolapse symptoms and follow-up anatomic support, reoperation rates, stress incontinence, bladder injury, and so forth, meaning um, mesh didn't really um, greatly improve outcomes. So mesh was real popular and actually through the MDR MOD database and self-reporting databases, the FDA became aware of a lot of increasing numbers of reports of adverse events. Most common events that were seen were things like um, mesh erosion in 35% of the, of the voluntary reports, pain, infection, bleeding, and dyspareunia and so on. Um, so this really raised the whiskers of the FDA. And this is a timeline of the FDA actions. In 2008, the FDA put out a public health notification just saying patients should be made aware that you can have these surgeries without mesh, but that occasionally, if you have mesh, a complication could occur. In 2011, that was updated to, to actually say that these complications are indeed not rare as a, a larger number of people were reporting them. And then um, ultimately they convened a panel at FDA, which decided to discuss reclassifying meshes for prolapse as high risk devices or class three devices. But they recommended that stress incontinence slings, which are made of mesh and sacral copepexy not be reclassified. This led to orders for post-market surveillance studies, which we helped participate in. And ultimately mesh was reclassified, vaginal mesh kits for, as class three or a high risk device. And in 2019, just exactly this time last year, actually it was in April, the FDA declined to approve the two remaining total bad, uh, mesh systems on the market. This led to a, a, um, a lot of litigation and um, this led to the largest uh, tort reform in history actually, with over 100,000 individual liability suits with settlements approaching $11 billion. So to clear up the air, I have a lot of, it always drives me crazy when people say mesh was banned by the FDA. That's not true. What the FDA action actually did was they declined to approve two specific to, uh, transvaginal mesh systems that were designed for prolapse. And they required the completion of the ongoing um, post-market surveillance studies. What the FDA action actually did not do was ban mesh, warn against the use of mesh for mid urethral slings, warn against abdominal sacrocopoplexy mesh. Abdominal sacrocopoplexy is placing this laparoscopically, robotically, or open to lift vaginal prolapse up. Um, although a study in JAMA actually, interestingly, not long ago showed that even abdominal sacrocopopexy out at six years may be associated with an up to 10% chance of developing a mesh erosion. Um, lastly, again, what did FDA say about slings? Nothing. Slings are still not considered high-risk devices. Slings have been shown to be safe and durable for over 17 years with over 2,000 publications, over 3 million slings, and they're considered the gold standard for patients that are seeking elective surgery and um, don't have um, the outcomes they desire with conservative therapy. So uh, thanks for listening to me. Um, I think we're going to hopefully, that was about a little bit about the past and the present. Let's talk about going forward uh, with our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Sokol. Um, we'll uh, bring up uh, the intro slide for the next speaker. Um, so Dr. Uh, Ekene Anantuku is an assistant professor of urology and director of urology at the Pelvic Health Center. She's a graduate of Duke and UNC Chapel Hill where she received her MD MPH before moving on to a urology residency at Vanderbilt. She uh, completed her fellowship in female urology at NYU. Since joining us in 2015, Dr. Anamchuku has been very busy with her research interests, which include both male and female urologic conditions, including neurourology, and is dedicated to spreading the word about bladder health. 
She has given dozens of lectures to physicians um, in addition to dozens of interviews on radio, TV, and internet programs, and we are thrilled to call her our partner. She's a compassionate surgeon, and we are grateful to have her on our team every day. Welcome, Dr. Enim Chuku. Thank you, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my talk here. All right, and so um, this evening I'm going to be speaking on the topic of mesh for stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse management. And Eric has really set that up nicely um, for me here. Um, the objectives of the talk for this evening include um, defining stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, describing the use of mesh for their management, and discussing the outcomes and complications. So um, to define stress urinary incontinence, it is the leakage of urine with activities such as coughing, sneezing, laughing, or exercise. Management options include lifestyle modifications, anti-incontinence pessary, pelvic floor muscle therapy, urethral bulking agents, and surgeries. Traditional surgical options include the birch, uh, pubovaginal slings, and newer, newer minimally invasive um, options include mid-urethral slings with synthetic mesh, and that's what I'll be focusing on this evening. Um, mid-urethral slings can be placed through a retropubic or a transobturator approach. There are also many slings and adjustable slings, which are beyond the scope of this evening's talk. So mid-urethral slings were introduced in the late 1990s, and they really changed the way female stress urinary incontinence is treated. It's applicable to the majority of women with stress urinary incontinence, and is now considered the gold standard for treating most women with stress urinary incontinence. A recent uh, Cochrane review um, concluded that pubovaginal sling is more effective than birch. In the same review, they also noted that mid-urethral sling is probably equivalent to pubovaginal slings. In addition, mid-urethral mid slings are also associated with significantly shorter operating time, fewer perioperative complications, lower risk of new onset detrusor overactivity, which is associated with an overactive bladder, um, no difference in voiding dysfunction, lower risk of long-term wound pain, and no differences in vaginal exposure of sling. A 2017 Cochrane review uh, reviewed uh, differences in outcomes and complications um, of transobturator and retropubic slings. And in that review, they noted that uh, retropubic slings were more associated with bladder perforation and suprapubic pain, whereas transobturator slings were more associated with groin pain. Special considerations are that bladder perforation, in most cases, can be addressed without significant long-term sequela if recognized immediately intraoperatively and managed appropriately, whereas groin pain in many cases is more challenging to manage and often requires reoperation. Does approach matter? Well, according to this Cochrane review, it does. With retropubic slings, the bottom to top route, which is where we um, pass the trocar from the vagina to the suprapubic incision, was more effective than the top to bottom route. It also was associated with less voiding dysfunction and fewer bladder perforations and vaginal exposures. As far as transobturator slings, they did not find a difference. So training is critical. Surgeons must be adequately trained before performing mid-urethral slings. Training includes principles of pelvic anatomy, as Eric alluded to, and pelvic surgery, as well as proper patient selection. There are complications that can occur that are unique to mesh, and these include vaginal uh, exposure, erosion, and thigh pain. So the surgeon must be well-versed with the potential complications how to recognize them, and how to treat them. When performed by experienced surgeons, the risk of mid-urethral sling is low and the benefit is high. So this is an example of an, an, an unrecognized injury. Um, and it's important to note that bladder perforation can occur with both retropubic and transobturator slings. So cystos uh, cystoscopy should be performed during every sling procedure. 
informed consent is critical. As part of the informed consent process, all patients should be made aware of the alternatives, uh, including non-surgical treatments of stress urinary incontinence. If they do choose a surgical treatment, they should also know the potential complications of a mid-urethral sling the frequency at which they are reported, the potential consequences of such complications, and how they could be treated if they did experience a complication. So in summary, for mid-urethral slings, um, these are the, the most extensively researched surgical treatments for stress urinary incontinence for women. They have good safety profile, they're highly effective in the short and medium term, and accruing evidence is demonstrating their effectiveness in the long term. They, are short, they have shorter operative time, rapid recovery for the patient. Efficacy compares favorably to any other procedure. But the surgeon must be well versed with the complications and how to manage them and how to recognize them. So then I'm going to move on to talking about pelvic organ prolapse, um, which is the descent of one or more pelvic organs into the vagina via one or more adjacent vaginal compartments. So you can have a cystocele, a rectocele, enterocele, apical prolapse. Conservative management includes pelvic floor physical therapy and pessary. These are low morbidity, can be managed by the patient, but they do require regular follow-up. Surgical options include an abdominal approach or a vaginal approach. As Eric talked um, mostly about the mesh augmented vaginal approach, there are also native tissue repairs as well that can be approached vaginally, and these can be done for, um, for cystoceles, for rectoceles, and for apical prolapse. There are also obliterative um, procedures that, um, that essentially narrow and shorten um, the vagina. And consider those like the copocleisis. As far as abdominal approach, um, there are a number of options there. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on sacrocopopexy, but they also include cerv uh, sacrocervicopexy and sacrohysteropexy. These can be done through an open approach or a minimally invasive approach using uh, laparoscopy or robotic-assisted laparoscopy. The benefit is that you do have some enhanced sacral magnification and visualization. Dissection can be aided by pneumoperitoneum. You have a clear visualization of the right ureter, and you also have lower morbidity, shorter hospital stay, and lower cost compared to open approach. For many surgeons, sacrocolpopexy is a treatment of choice, especially for post-hysterectomy vault prolapse. Um, the data has shown that there's improved anatomic outcomes compared to native tissue repairs. Success rates as high as 74 to 98%. Um, it, and it's considered one of the most durable operations for advanced prolapse with less than 5% um, reoperation rates uh, reported in the literature. It also aids with preservation of normal vaginal axis and length. However, Complication rates are higher in sacrocolpopexy when compared to native tissue vaginal repairs. In one systematic review, they found that ileus uh, and bowel obstruction uh, was higher with 2.7% in the sacrocolpopexy group versus the vaginal um, prolapse repair group. They found something similar with mesh and suture complications with 4.2% compared to 0.4%. So what types of mesh do we use for sacrocolpopexy? Well, the recommendation is type 1 polypropylene mesh, which is a monofilament with large pore size. This type of mesh is associated with lower risks of mesh exposure. They come in both a Y mesh and an L mesh configuration. Non-type 1 meshes, which were used uh, traditionally, or years ago, um, were noted to be associated with higher complication rates. These types of mesh were heavier, multifilament, and small pore size. So what does the literature say about vaginal mesh exposure? Well, in the literature, it ranges widely from 0 to 27 percent. The presentation is generally asymptomatic, so some folks don't have any, some women don't have any um, symptoms at all. Others have vaginal spotting, vaginal bleeding, pain, dyspareunia, and or hyspareunia, where the partner can, can feel the, the mesh in the vagina. In the CARE trial, they looked at this 
as Eric alluded to as well, at two years and at seven years. And at two years, they found an, a mesh or suture exposure rate of about 6%. At seven years, they estimated the probability of developing one was about 10.5%. And the authors also noted a 5% reoperation rate for mesh complications in that same study. It's also important to note, however, that almost half of the subjects in this trial had non-type 1 polypropylene mesh. So this may have increased um, the risk of mesh um, exposure um, and complication. Two other systematic reviews um, noted 2 to 3% on average um, mesh exposure rates with a range of 0 to 8%. Other mesh-related complications include um, ileus and bowel obstruction, and so the surgeon must have a high index of suspicion, and this should prompt CT with IV and, or, uh, IV and oral contrast. It's also important that the surgeon routinely um, cover the mesh with peritoneum in order to uh, reduce the risk of, um, of bowel obstruction and ileus. New onset hematuria, irritative urinary symptoms, recurrent UTIs should also prompt cystoscopy to rule out erosion in the bladder. Pain with bowel movements or rectal bleeding are rare, but should prompt endoscopic evaluation. And postoperative back pain or symptoms of general malaise and or fever should also um, prompt um, evaluation for a discitis. Um, in these cases, the surgeon should obtain imaging generally an MRI. And we know that discitis, although thankfully rare, is associated with higher graft fixation points and use of metal fixation devices. Management is generally um, IV antibiotics and removal of the mesh. Risk factors for mesh-related complications include um, smoking. So that has been shown to, to cause a 5.2-fold risk of mesh exposure. Non-type 1 polypropylene mesh, as I talked about before, cause a four-fold risk of uh, increased risk of mesh exposure. Concomitant total hysterectomy has been shown to cause a two to seven-fold risk, though there are some other small um, retrospective reviews that haven't found that same finding. Um, sacrocervical pexy may be protective. In this particular study, um, they did not find a statistically significant difference, but they did find in folks that had uh, concomitant total hysterectomy, a rate of 7.5% um, had, uh, excuse me, 7.5% of the women had a mesh-related um, uh, complication, whereas 2.3% had uh, mesh um, exposure in the supracervical hysterectomy group. Use of permanent braided sutures, such as ethabon, is also associated with increased risk of vaginal exposure, 3.7% uh, experiencing that complication um, in this particular study uh, versus zero in the delayed absorbable suture group. And intraoperative cystotomy is also thought to be associated with increased risk of bladder erosion. So in summary, Smokers should be counseled regarding the higher risk of mesh complications. Modify the surgical plan as needed. Avoid concomitant total hysterectomy. Preservation of the cervix probably reduces mesh erosion rates. Use type 1 mesh. Avoid braided permanent suture, especially on the vagina. And aggressively treat vaginal atrophy with vaginal estrogen. That's, that probably helps as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anam Chuku. Um, we'll now move on to our uh, final presentation. Uh, Dr. Brooke Gerland is a professor of surgery um, and colorectal surgery. She's the medical director of the Pelvic Health Center and director of colorectal surgery at the Pelvic Health Center. Dr. Gerland spent the majority of her career away from the West Coast. She studied at Barnard and Hahnemann um, and served as the medical director for the a Center for Pelvic Floor Dysfunction and Reconstructive Surgery at Maimonides and of the Digestive Disease Institute at the Cleveland Clinic before joining us as the colorectal surgeon at the Multidisciplinary Pelvic Health Center in Redwood City. Um, her academic interests include minimally invasive surgery and benign colorectal diseases. And she uh, joins our FPMRS faculty in the multidisciplinary education of our fellows and residents. 
She is an incredible motivating colleague and I'm grateful for her mentorship. And we thank her for organizing this program for you tonight. Uh, welcome Dr. Gerland. Okay. All right, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, all right, I should be shared. Just confirm with me that you see that I'm shared with a thumbs up. Okay, you good? I'm good to go, great, thanks so much. Okay, so controversies in the pelvis uh, using mesh on the rectum. I have no disclosures related to this talk. Um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's define rectal prolapse. Rectal prolapse occurs when the anterior rectum invaginates and slides through the anal canal. Uh, so on a rectal exam, this is an exam under anesthesia, look how that anterior part of the rectum comes out and it's delivered. All right, and notice that most prolapse starts anteriorly. Uh, let's, can, let's sort of talk about internal rectal prolapse versus external. On internal rectal prolapse, the circumferential folds of that distal rectum are just above the sphincter, whereas an external rectal prolapse, it progresses uh, beyond, as you saw. But it's not a rectocele, and sometimes patients can get confused with this. So it's not the bulging of the anterior rectal wall into the vagina, but it's coming out of the sphincters. Clinical presentation, and this is something that we did in our center where we looked to say what bothered patients most. So fecal incontinence, pain, some bleeding, mucus discharge were all common symptoms seen. The real question is what came first with rectal prolapse? Is this a functional or an anatomic problem? Does chronic straining lead to rectal prolapse that then can cause stretching of the anal sphincter? It can lead to incontinence. It certainly can cause pain. Or are we dealing with a pelvic floor injury or weakness that's leading to rectal prolapse that then causes a mechanical obstruction of the bowel lumen, which can lead to chronic straining? I will not be answering, I will not give you an answer to those at the end of this talk. <laughs> All right, so treatment for rectal prolapse, uh, improve stool consistency and frequency, avoid straining-like behaviors, pelvic floor physical therapy helps to strengthen and coordinate the aid of my PT friends, and then surgery is really the only treatment option. We have no, no uh, rectal prolapse pessaries. Goals of rectal prolapse surgery are to restore the anatomy, improve function, avoid complications, and to avoid new onset constipation. There are over 100 surgical, surgical options for rectal prolapse. There's abdominal, perineal. In general, abdominal, 5 to 15% recurrence rates, 15% new onset of constipation. Perineal operations have higher recurrence rates, and it's tolerated in frail patients. But there's pure quality, underpowered studies fail to identify the ideal procedure, and we're not debating that today. That's not why we're here. Rectal mesh procedures, which is the focus of this, um, you know, of this webinar, uh, have been around for some time. But the main focus now, or what's popularized, is Andre Dorr's ventral mesh rectopexy. So this involves anterior placement of, rest, of mesh down to the pelvic floor with fixation to the sacrum. And these are just some highlights showing the patient in the lithotomy position. Uterus is being elevated. That's peritoneum covering the rectum and the vagina. Here's the sigmoid. For those of you who don't see it, I've, you get a visual of the ureter and the step off of the sacrum. So this is the important part. We're opening up that peritoneum to expose the anterior rectum. And in this case, and you may not have experience looking at this view in this way, we are very low in the pelvic area. So this is gonna open it up, giving us place for mesh. And again, it's cleared even further. And by putting something in the rectum, and in this case, there's a probe, and I'm moving it around. And if you can kind of, you probably don't have a sense of it, but know how low I'm all the way down to the pelvic floor. This is a piece of biologic graph that I happen to be using in this specific case. And it's being, it's being sutured and sewed onto the anterior rectum. So it's just to the top surface. It's not, these are not full thickness bites. I'm doing it robotically. About 10 sutures are placed. You get the idea. And now the top part is being fixed to the anterior longitudinal ligament along the sacrum. A, a space has been cleared. For those of you with sacral culpopexy experience, it seems very similar as it is. 
The rectum's not under any tension. It's just relaxing comfortably um, in, the, in that concavity. And that mesh will be fixed down. All right, and you can kind of see how that goes. I've already placed one suture. This is gonna be the second suture. Um, this really lends itself to a combined operation. So sacral culpopexy could be performed also. It restores the anatomy. It's very physiologic. All right, and also we do, we cover the peritoneum after. I'm talking a little bit faster than the view. And then ultimately we'll cover that peritoneum so that you will lose, so there'll no longer be a deep pouch of Douglas and we've closed off any type of enterocele or any other pelvic floor um, hernias. So this Andre Dor uh, ventral mesh rectopexy, what was the tipping point for that? There certainly have been mesh procedures that have been around before. Uh, it was minimally invasive, more physiologic than other procedures, and certainly more physiologic than a posterior rectopexy, which involves, uh, which involves going behind the rectum and potentially can cause neurologic injury and, um, and new-onset constipation low complication rates, improved function for fecal incontinence and obstructed defecation. Uh, it took off in Europe uh, and Australia, but access to training in the US, more mesh, fear of mesh and mesh litigation has made it a little bit slower to take hold in the US, but certainly is uh, becoming more popular here. So what about mesh and what about the complications? Is it safe? And that is essentially the focus of today. So looking at uh, close to 4,000 patients, eight studies, all from Europe and Australia, because we do not have that data in the US, um, follow-up is 12 to 74 months, and it's looking at mesh erosion rates. Um, following these studies, you can see that there's both prospective and retrospective studies. Uh, I want you to look at this. There's a, this series that has 919 patients is Andre Dorr's study. Uh, so he has very long-term data that's out there because his initial study was in 2000 or his initial report was in 2004. And then the erosion profile is rectal, vaginal um, erosions, depending on the group. Now, what types of mesh did they use? And I'm gonna um, point to uh, a Kenny's talk where she looked at, where she showed a picture of the mesh of this polypropylene. Uh, maybe Eric, you did also. So the majority are a lightweight polypropylene mesh. Um, you can see early on there's this titanium mesh that only 4.5%. That was a troublemaker, certainly had some erosions, not, not commonly used. And the biologic mesh is reported in about 11%, and that's more a factor of it was just not available. Um, and biologic meshes have become more available uh, over time. Uh, so polypropylene. Now looking to see synthetic versus biologic erosion rates. Um, and again, it's hard to say from this specific study because there's such a smaller percentage of biologic that was used, but overall the erosion rates was under 2%. And so there's may potentially some suggestion that long-term that using biologic will prevent erosion rates, but not necessarily, um, uh, but, but it's too early to say. So looking at comparing mesh versus a suture rectopexy, because I told you, I already sort of set you up, there really aren't any good studies that says that one, one procedure is better than another. Uh, this is a randomized double-blinded study that looked at lap ventral mesh rectopexy versus lap posterior suture rectopexy. Um, and the posterior rectopexy is the traditional one. Um, the ventral one uh, is what we're talking about with this mesh today. They powered it to look at, to look at not specifically to look at recurrence rates, they powered it to look at function. And what they did is they blinded the patient and the, and, well, the surgeon was only blinded, they gave them the envelopes at the day of the surgery. And recurrence rates was 8% for the lap ventral, 23%, but that was not statistically significant. So there's potentially a suggestion uh, with the ventral mesh rectopexy. But the real interesting data is essentially is looking at um, at one year, they didn't see much of a difference, but they've published their six-year post-surgery data. And looking at pre-op um, pre ventral mesh rectopexy data, to post-op ventral mesh rectopexy data, looking at, at questionnaires that are associated with obstructed defecation and constipation, you see significant improvements at six years. Um, incontinence rates, uh, not as much. So, so both will have improvements uh, in incontinence rates, but not such a big difference between these two procedures.
So is ventral mesh rectopex seat for everyone? Um, I can tell you uh, what we're doing in our clinic. Uh, we do abdominal and perineal procedures. Majority of them are ventral rectopexies, uh, but we're certainly doing a combination of other procedures for abdominal. Um, could it be used for the elderly? There's certainly plenty of data that says that it can, and this is what, um, what we're seeing in our population. So in summary, rectal mesh complications are less than 2% based on European literature. We don't have any US data to, uh, either way. Long-term constipation scores are better based on that single study uh, that's out there on with ventral rectopexy compared to suture rectopexy. And we believe in an individualized treatment for patients with rectal prolapse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerland. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Gerland, absolutely. So now we're going to proceed to the panel discussion portion of our evening. And we would like to welcome to the panel, Dr. Bertha Chen. So Dr. Chen is a professor of urogynecology and the division chief of urogynecology. She has made many contributions to Stanford since starting here as a medical student and OBGYN resident. She was a key leader in the development of the multidisciplinary Stanford Fibroid Center and has served as the chief of gynecology and division chief of urogynecology and has sat on dozens of committees serving the academic and clinical missions at Stanford, all while maintaining her focus as a basic scientist in her own lab. Her extensive research in rodent models and regenerative medicine have earned her numerous prestigious grants. She's a mentor and teacher to our junior faculty, and we are thrilled to have her scientific perspective on our panel tonight. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Chen. Um, so we have a few questions um, in the Q&A, um, and so uh, this, uh, these questions can be answered by any of our panelists. The first question is, what are the most common native tissues used during surgery? How is it harvested? And what are the native tissue procedures commonly used at Stanford? You'll probably have to pick. Everybody wants yeah, to. Yeah, it looks like I'm going <laughs> to. I shouldn't be answering that question. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I guess, Bertha, since you just joined us. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I guess since I'm the probably the oldest member of the um, uh, of the group, I, I feel qualified to uh, to answer this question since um, this is how we started out. You know, 50, 60 years ago, when there were no such things as the polypropylene mesh. Um, so for native tissue, there are two sources that are most common. Uh, we use fascia, and uh, so that can come uh, from abdominal fascia, so, uh, and that's harvested via a fanosteel incision, very similar to how we do a C-section, and then we just cut a strip of the abdominal fascia. Um, but uh, um, the fascia lata is also commonly used, and uh, that can be harvested in the leg. Um, it's a fairly simple procedure, but generally it would add probably about 20 minutes to your surgical time. And the only complication with that that I've seen over the years that, and that's also reported in the literature is that uh, patients could experience a little bit of uh, transient uh, leg pain uh, for a couple of weeks, but that generally resolves. I might just uh, add, just for clarity, Dr. Chen is speaking about um, autologous urinary incontinence slings um, for pelvic organ prolapse. Tissue doesn't necessarily need to be harvested. There is a connective tissue layer underneath the vaginal wall that we call fascia. Maybe it's not fascia, but a connective tissue layer that can be stretched. And often these prolapse repairs for things like cystoceles and rectoceles are basically plicating or pleating that connective tissue underneath the skin to reinforce it. So in a case like that, these are typically outpatient surgeries. Nothing's harvested per se. Uh, things are just buttressed or plicated. Um, and that's more commonly done for vaginal prolapse repair. Dr. Gerland, do you want to comment on a native but, repairs for you, prolapse? I, I just want to. I just want to comment that also that you know with the fascia lot of uh, ligament as well as the abdominal fascia, you can use that for uh, sacrocopalpexies in patients who do not want mesh. Just yeah. Side comment on that. Uh, 
So, Kavita, I would just say that suture rectopexy is a non-mesh pr procedure that we use the you know person's native tissue, but it involves a lot of dissection and uh, the risk of you know functional issues. Okay. Uh, the next question that we have: When counseling a patient for a super cervical hysterectomy versus a total hysterectomy for benign indications, should any consideration consideration be given for future risk of prolapse or risk of future prolapse surgery? Is there any data regarding type of hysterectomy and sorry and prolapse? Um, I guess uh, Dr. Sokol and Chen, if you wouldn't mind commenting on this. I'll, I'll, I'll comment first and be curious about Lisa's too. Um, so, so there's a little bit of data. I actually was part of the uh, team that wrote the national guidelines for AAGL on choice of surgery for people undergoing um, uh, repair of uterine prolapse. Evidence does suggest that if you have some prolapse of the uterus, for instance, to begin with, hysterectomy without a concomitant apical repair increases your future risk for vaginal vault prolapse down the line. And so... Some people posit that if you cut the uterosacral ligaments, for instance, um, that's the kind of the upper support of the, the vagina, that there may be a slight increased risk, but that's not necessarily been borne out in randomized controlled trials. But just to play the devil's advocate, because I love panels, there's really emerging evidence that if you leave everything intact and lift it up, you have better outcomes at five years than if you have a hysterectomy. Now that's just one study coming out of Scandinavia that was the prize winning paper at this last year's AUGS meeting but there's emerging evidence for uterine sparing prolapse surgery that used to be done with grafts, but now can be done just with sutures through the sacrospinous ligaments or uterosacral ligaments, so. Dr. Shannon Rogogupta, would you like to add anything to that? No, okay. Uh, well, I, I agree with Eric, actually. I think if, you know, if they start out with prolapse, chances are that they will eventually develop prolapse if you leave the cervix there. In fact, uh, today I just did a case of this uh, prolapsing cervix. And um, what I would say to the patient who opts for a super cervical uh, uh, hysterectomy is that when the cervix does prolapse as they age, the surgery uh, for it might be a little complex because the bowel will tend to be adherent to the top of the cervix. And, and as you dissect, there could be a slightly increased risk of uh, bowel injury if there, there's an intra-abdominal procedure that needs to be done, for example, a sacral copalpexy, or uh, if you want to do a uh, uh, uterosacral ligament suspension at that, at that juncture. I would say that the decision-making for this really begins in the office with a thorough exam. I would say that there's many indications for hysterectomy, um, even within the umbrella of benign pelvic floor disorders. And it's also very common to have prolapse that patients are unaware of, right? Asymptomatic pelvic organ prolapse. And so when you begin with that thorough history and that physical exam, you'll be able to stratify women who do have prolapse and who really don't. Um, if you feel your exam is inadequate, then examining under anesthesia is very common. And I think that's very important so that you do not perform a hysterectomy in a woman with prolapse without a concurrent prolapse procedure, because I think those are the women who are at higher risk um, and who, for whom the hysterectomy sort of gets a bad name, um, because within a year, all of a sudden, the cervix or the vault, right, is now fallen. Um, and they're sort of wondering why they thought it was all taken care of. So I would definitely encourage that. Um, we did recently publish a population literature regarding the question of women who were known to already have prolapse, uh, stratifying them by compartment of prolapse repair, and then whether or not they had a concurrent hysterectomy to try and understand what the population trends were, given this you know, question of to hist or not to hist. And interestingly enough, um, hysterectomy concurrently at the time of a prolapse repair does reduce your risk of recurrent surgery, uh, surgery for recurrent prolapse, no matter what, whether you're doing rectocele plus hysterectomy, cystocele plus hysterectomy, or hysteropexy plus hysterectomy. Again, that's on a population basis. Um, so that comes with its limitations, but it was very consistent, the effect. Um, the difference is small overall, 
which we found to be um, very sort of reassuring um, and gives us the ability as clinicians and as surgeons to really make more informed consent and you know, individualized treatment plans depending on um, your exam, your impression, and what the patient's goals are. Thank you. So we have just one last question um, and feel free to add questions to the Q&A. Um, for how long do you follow your surgical patients? For patients who undergo a sling procedure or sacral copalpexy, should they be counseled that they need a GYN exam every year by their primary gynecologist to examine the vagina for mesh? In, uh, chime in on this one. Um, I, you know, for my patients, I do tell them that they need an annual exam. What we learned from the extended care trial is that although the rates of uh, mesh exposure were low initially, they did increase over time. So even at seven years, they saw, uh, they saw uh, an increase in the number of folks that were, or a number of women that were experiencing this. So for that reason, I think it is important that, um, that women uh, have an annual exam uh, to, to look for any uh, signs of uh, mesh exposure or suture exposure in the vagina. Thank you. 